John Tiller Bonner, Lives of a Biologist, Adventures in a Century of Extraordinary Science, Harvard University Press, 2002. Chapter Coming Together, 1980-2000. Have been neglecting one aspect of my life that has been very important to me and spends both this 20-year period and previous one. It has to do with my love of fishing and spending the summers in the Margaret Valley in Cape Breton in northern Nova Scotia. When we first came to the valley in 1959, on the chance recommendation of a friend. All but the main roads were dirt, and the farming was done almost entirely with horses. The first few years we had cabin on a farm, and it was bliss for the children. They could help bringing in the hay, and Jonathan would lead King, a huge workhorse, away from the barn to lift the loose hay up into the attic loft with the pitching machine. There were fewer bridges, the small ones, single lane, and more ferries. One might I want went across the island to pick up friends at the Sydney airport, and when we got to the brassed ore on the island sea, loch that cuts down the middle of the Cape Breton, at one in the morning we could see the ferry on the other side. There was a big sign saying that to call the ferry after midnight we should press the bell in the middle of the sign. It was pouring rain, so we dashed out and pressed it. Nothing happened, so we went out and pressed again. Considerably later, we took a careful look at the bell from behind the sign and could see that there were no wires attached to it at all. It was just there to make one feel good. After about two hours, the ferry came and we were rescued. Another sharp memory were the pit ponies. The local coal mines were not yet totally mechanized, and they used ponies for moving the coal inside the mines. The month of August was a holiday for all the miners, and they brought the ponies up to the surface to gamble in the fields and eat green grass for the month. The rest of their year was spent in eternal darkness. It all changed rather rapidly in the 1960s. Most of the roads became b blacktop and tractors replaced the horses. During the same period, my brother Tony was experiencing an almost identical evolution in his small village in Mallorca, Mallorca, that he told me that every spring on the particular Sunday, a patron 
scent of animals day the farmers would bring their beasts mostly mules to the courtyard in front of the church to be blessed by the priest the first year of tractors a, f a farmer brought his tractor in a church doctrine animals and machines are distant so this practice was discouraged in many ways something important was lost by those changes but the hard life of a farmer was made easier as one youngest as our youngest andrew grew up enough to be left with his siblings Ruth began to join me on the afternoon fishing expeditions she soon developed into a first-rate fisher and cast an elegant fly she concentrated on trout which became her passion but inevitably she hooked the salmon it was memorable occasion we saw a fish steering in the pool nearest our cabin and i urged ruth to give it a try she had on the hip boots and could not wade out far enough to reach the fish so we traded and she put on my high waders she was lost inside them and my feet were horribly compressed in her boots but she cast out to the right spot and almost immediately was on the big fish she complained it was too big and wanted to give me the rod but i urged her on and soon she was in the middle of the most dramatic struggle with very active fish because she was very unsteady in the oversized waders i grabbed them from behind and together we followed the fish by that time my father who was visiting appeared and he became as excited as the two of us he kept calling encouraging things to root with gentle advice and then would roar at me things that always started for god's sake john get her to do this or that as for ruth were not there what i didn't realize was that an entire road crew of men had left their machines together by the river's edge to watch the fun after a great struggle the fish was finally landed and at that moment a great cheer rose from the gallery on the bank the fish weighed uh, 17 pounds and we had a group photograph with Ruth beside it where she and the fish look about the same size as the years followed we would fish together almost daily and in the afternoons after my writing it was splendid period of our lives we always seemed to enjoy one another's company and the setting on the river could not have been more beautiful i remember that on the perfect sunny afternoon in a secluded spot we were glowing and suddenly became overcome with desire but as uh, we progressed it soon became obvious that love making uh, high waders presented insurmountable problems so finally we just lay there 
in the grass, laughing at the absurdity of it all. For many years, writing in the morning and fishing or walking in the afternoon has been continues to be me, my way of living on the Marjorie, Marjorie, the only thing that has the changed is that I now longer send illegible handwritten manuscripts to secretary in Princeton, all spliced with cutting and pasting. Now, that includes those very words, everything pours into my laptop computer and emerges looking as for it had already been published. I'm often asked, how can I write in a such a remote spot without a reference library? I try to bring up what books and articles I might need, but inevitably I fail. Sometimes can uh, send for something that is missing. More often, they'll rely on my faulty memory and then check everything when get back to Princeton. It is thought in the middle of very factual work, one suddenly introduces a bit of wild fiction. For I'm never quite certain if I have remembered correctly. This got me into trouble only once. I was writing a paper in which wanted to refer to a work of Japanese scientist, but didn't have the reference, so gave him fictional Japanese sounding name Okimoto. When got back to the library, I unearthed the correct name when can no longer remember. I can only remember my Okimoto and changed it in my paper, but didn't uh, root out all the Okimotos, missed some, so that then paper was published, received a couple of queries about the work of Akimoto. The other reason the Cape Breton has become such a splendid place to write it because everything is so beautiful. In the beginning of each summer, I was tremendously keen to have those wonderfully uninterrupted mornings where I can think about one thing, what I'm writing at the time. By the end of the summer, yearn to get back to laboratory work and the bustle of university life. The only time I have varied my summer schedule was when Dr. Park was very old. He was a good friend whom liked and admired greatly. He had long retired and spent the summers on the uh, Marguerite alone in his cottage. He could not drive, so every Thursday we would go fishing together. Those days are etched in my mind. He had so many delightful stories, he would rarely repeat himself. One day he told me that the, some years ago he received a telephone call from New York from the president of a well-known company that made fishing equipment that men wanted to come to Baltimore to consult him. He said, you know, John, have always tried to appear different about my science and medicine, but cannot conceal my absurd vanity 
when it comes to my fishing. So I was thrilled at the prospect of his visit. He came to the pediatrics department and my secretary ushered him in. After the formalities and when he was all settled, asked him what I could do for him. He replied, my feet hurt. The pathos of moment was not lost on me and again came that wonderful smile. We continued those expeditions during the summer on his 19th year, but he was not well. He had a pacemaker by then, and we would worry about him all along in the cottage. One day he had bad spell, and a mutual friend that I decided should spend the night with him and see him through this rough patch. Then told him that I was going to do, uh, he said absolutely not. In fact, he was quite irritated at the thought of this invasion of his privacy. The next morning, the telephone rang while I was in the breakfast, and that familiar voice said, this Ned Park telephony will be happy to hear that survived the night. My last letter from him was in March 1969 his 91st year. In it, he says, I was completely surprised to receive your new book. Perhaps I ought not to have been surprised, for it seems to me no sooner do you reach the Marguerite than you become pregnant. Your uh, fishing clothes hide your state and no one suspects when suddenly a book is born. The last 20 years of the century showed a steady increase in the progress of biology. There may not have been so many radically new discoveries and turnings into new directions, as there have been earlier, but there has been a great deal of important solidification and refinement of the advances of the past. It is more difficult to look at this recent period with as much objectivity as the earlier ones, simply because it is so close one thing is clear, the number of biologists has greatly increased along with the number of new journals. Again, the largest proliferation has been in molecular biology. But this is generally true for all of biology, including ecology, because of the very real concerns with the future of our environment. We have finally come to the point that the prevalence of people is beginning to be felt. The forests are disappearing. The suburbs are expanding. The traffic is increasingly heavy over our ever-expanding roads. The congestion in airports is ever more evident and wherever we go we see the problems of pollution and water shortages. In some regions of the world famine is in a serious matter as it is a decimation caused by AIDS, especially in Africa, but disease and hunger have always cursed mankind. They just take different forms today and uh, certainly don't curb the overall population growth. Along with this rising multitude of people have come amazing 
technical innovations. There may be too many people, but communicating with one another is now much easier than with email and cell phones, and getting the distant or near places is quicker despite the jams. The world is uh, simultaneously becoming larger and smaller. In many countries, this has been a period of prosperity and there have been no widespread world wars. In biology, there have been some important advances on a number of fronts. The power of mathematical modeling in ecology and evolutionary studies has gone forward, forward at a brisk pace with rewarding results. There has been a great activity in neurobiology, in the study of the brain, involving again mathematical modeling to gain insights into its complexity, as well as a greater knowledge of how the neurons communicate with one another on molecular level. The progress in our understanding of the relation of genes to behavior has been dramatic. Developmental biology is making great strides forward for thanks to the pioneer work of Christian nussen wolhardt and Eric Wieshaus and later many others. It is possible to find the genes responsible for developmental steps. Now we know an enormous amount more of the chemical details of development in, the, in both plants and animals and slime molds, not again. It is thus fusions with genetics that generate all sorts of important new things. One striking aspect of the study of both genetics and development is emergence of uh, model organisms. This has occurred because the initial experiments were done on a particular plant or animal and with the head start, the organism becomes the logical focus for subs subsequent research. In this century, there has been a tremendous emphasis on the bacterium Escherichia coli, the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, and the nematode worm Cynarabditis elegans. But beginning back earlier in the 20th century and farther back into the 19th century, there are many other that have played a small role. To mention a few, there are Mendel's garden peas, followed by other organisms such as maize, amphibians, chick, and sea urchin embryos, yeast, myxobacteria, zebrafish, the higher plant Arabidopsis, and cellular slime molds. One could add a few more, and the list would still be incomplete. For instance, Silat protozoa, Hydra, and other hydroids, sponges, Volvox, and other algae, true slime molds, myxomycets, fungi, fucomycets, mice, and other mammals. The degree to which those various examples have been directly illuminated by genetics and molecular biology varies, but even in those cases where the influence has been small due to the lack of attention, this is uh, beginning to change. In fact, one can say that it is inconceivable to do developmental biology today on any organism without genetics and molecular biology. 
evolutionary biology has also evolved. Our appreciation of uh, natural selection operating at all levels, from genes to groups of individuals, has deepened, give greater understanding of the consequences. We have become more appreciative of how the environment interacts with the genes and how changes that are not controlled by the genes play a key role in evolution. To me, one of the most interesting phenomena is that Charles Darwin is more esteemed today than he has ever been. This has happened not only because his views fit so well with our modern ones, but also because many at, uh, at a time someone imagines they have a new insight into some detail only to discover that a Darwin had the same insight well over a hundred years ago. One of the astounding things to me was the speed with which new equipment, new methods, new tools developed in the great crescendo by the end of century. To list them all would paralyze my tale. There are so many major advances, but let me mention a very few well-known highlights, some of which affect our lives. The PCR, polymerized chain reaction method of isolating small bits of DNA and amplifying them to make many copies has become a vital tool in forensic medicine and has decided to guilt or innocence of criminal. It is also used to great profit in molecular biology and even in evolutionary biology. For now, we can trace the ancestry, the phylogeny of any group of animals or plants. It has even played a role for the modern historian, for instance, by showing that Thomas Jefferson may have been the father of his slave Sally Hemings' children. In the world of microscopy, the old brass microscopes have been replaced by the most extraordinary computer-driven microscopes that have revealed a hitherto unseen interior of living cells and tissues in ways that go beyond the imagination. Wow! Behind all those tools of biochemistry and cell biology and behind so much that we do today is the computer. Computers have introduced not just the conveniences of word processing and email, wonders that they are, but they have become the way we control and operate our complex environment in the laboratory. Furthermore, they have become the way to store vast quantities of data and retrieve instantly one item from a great multitude. And I have not touched upon their role in mathematical modeling. We are in an era where everything gets mathematical model, sometimes to great benefit, for it gives uh, us insight where it was lacking. A pre-computer example of how effective mathematical insight can be is the work of Robert Mark Arthur and E. O. Wilson on island, island biogeography. The mathematics illuminated why and how the fauna and flora of islands differ from those of the mainland. In more current models, the computer plays a key role, and often the objective 
is not to simplify, the, but to predict how future changes would affect the complicated present. The computer also deals with the biological literature in a wonderful way. When I was a graduate student, it was expected of all of us that we would have a good idea of the important papers in every journal, in the current rack in the library. Today, there are some, so many journals, and they are so specialized. Such familiarity would be out of the question. Fortunately, all these journals are online, and with a click of two, uh, we uh, can access uh, uh, an abstract, often an entire text, and the figures in color. Not only that, but we can search for a subject or an uh, author with instantaneous results. The good part is that a vast literature is uh, within our reach. The bad part is that we become ever more narrow and specialized. In my own research, mentioned earlier, among other things, wanted to find out the nature of the repelling gas that the slime molds used. And this turned out to be ammonia. Send the paper to journal Nature, probably the most difficult journal in which to get contribution accepted. And after some time, they agreed to publish it. They sent me the proofs from London, but for some reason they came in uh, two envelopes. It turned out the second envelope had been sent to me by mistake. It should have gone to Washington, D.C., Office of Nature. Being partly human, read the contents, which turn out to be all the inter-office memoranda concerning my paper. Quite fascinating. Among other things, they kept referring to me as a G.O.M. of slime molds. I was no longer a young Turk, but grand old man, seemed to me going too far. It was an extraordinary bit of luck that the solution to the chemical nature of acrazine should have come so easily. As I described earlier, one of the big projects in our laboratory in the 1970s had been finding hemotractin or acrazine that gathered the amoeba together into multicellular mass. Not all slime molds use cyclic AMP for this purpose. So some years later started a major effort to find the chemical composition of the acrazine of one of the other major groups of slime molds. This took 10 years. By contrast to the uh, practically overnight cyclic AMP success story. The solution was largely due to heroic efforts of my research assistant Hannah Satters, who collected and concentrated gallons of liquid that had surrounded aggregating amoeba. There were a number of people who contributed to the early phases of this project and our final bit of good luck came when Osamu Shimamura, a distinguished chemist then at Princeton, agreed to do the ultimate purification. With his unparalleled skill, he went through a whole series of purification steps so that ultimately had a minute quantity of material that was 98% pure. He sent it off to an outfit that does mass spectrographic analysis and from their result 
it was possible to identify a new compound that was rather a unique combination of two amino acids, which we call, called glory. The compound then had to be synthesized, which was done by some chemists who specialized in such synthesis, and they finally sent us a few grams of presumed uh, synthetic acrasin. It arrived in the afternoon, and Hannah Sutter's said she immediately wanted to use the amoeba that we were that were ready, which meant staying late in the laboratory. Had to go to a retirement party for a dean, but periodically during the speeches would desert root and go to telephone booth to call Hannah. As the evening progressed, the manufactured compound slowly revealed itself. It met our highest hopes. It was active at the predicted very low concentration. I was so excited that during the course of the dinner between my telephone calls, without realizing it must have consumed large amount of wine, had no sensation of it at the time, but the next morning had the most impressive hangover. Vorfiov, gigantic, drunk. The entire excitement was almost as keen as the arrival of a new child, but in this case, the pregnancy had lasted 10 years. During the 1980s, devoted much energy in Scotland and elsewhere to what hoped would be a major work, my plan was partly to penetrate more deeply into the relation between those biological phenomena that were under the immediate direction of the genes and those in which thus there were many intervening steps between initial gene product and the end result, such as genes that affect behavior. At the same time, wanted to relate those ideas to another general term that uh, always fascinated me. The first organisms on Earth were small and relatively simple, but during the course of evolution, both animals and plants became larger, more complex, fact uh, amply recorded and fossil record. My aim was to show how this could be accounted for by natural selection. Furthermore, ever since my exposure to the influence of Robert MacArthur wanted to understand how those evolutionary changes in the structure of organisms might have influenced or been influenced by their ecological environment. Wove in all my previous ideas on the importance of organisms as life cycles and on the relation between a selection for an increase in the size of organisms and the concomitant adjustment that needed to be made to remain efficient such as the increased division of labor within organisms to accommodate the size, tried hard to put all those terms together in one place, show the connection 
between them in the evolution of the complexity, which was published in 1988 and later in a uh, lighter and a more personal account in Life Cycles, published in 1995. My sabbatical and summer writings over the years were cumulative. The ideas were a succession that seemed to want to refine themselves. It is a thought it took me 40 years to think a problem through, had always flinched when hear the old adage I no longer remember who said it, that each author has only one book in him, and all subsequent books are the same book in different clothing. For myself, I like to think that I am just a slow thinker and a slow developer, and that uh, the one book I have inside me has taken 40 years of uh, larval development. Think what might happen if I live to be a hundred. As I look over the new ideas that developed in my books, see that some have mercifully died while others flourish. Today, in the literature without any discernible connecting thread to those earlier terms of mine. This was no doubt due partly to there being ideas that were, quote, in the air, but partly this was my own fault because I either used labels that did not properly convey the concept, or I put the matter in a context that was too restricted. Let me give you two examples. One is the concept that we know today as modularity. It is the idea that in development the genes and their products are packed in relatively independent units. As a result, they can change, say, through the mutations of some genes that will only affect their model and not other parts of the body. In this way, constructive or advantageous changes can accumulate with less chance that they will have deleterious effects on the rest of the developing embryos. This concept is implied in old ideas that began in the 19th century with Ernst Haeckel and were re-examined and hunted by many others in the 20th century. It is known as heterochrony. Their different organs within the body can alter their time of appearance so that an organ that arises earlier in the development of the ancestor appears late in the development of the descendant. In another form, it is also the subject of famous essay by Herbert Simon, who pointed out that a watchmaker could increase his efficiency if he first put the parts together in the smaller units instead of putting the watch together piece by piece. My earlier mistake was to identify the problem but give it in the forgettable label chains of steps, quote, chains of steps in a size and cycle. Years later came up with quote gene nets. Gene nets. 
in the evolution of complexity, which was a slight improvement. By then, the computer age was upon us, and the concept was well established. Information could be effectively stored in uh, models. This has become the obvious and best way to label an important biological phenomenon. The other example centers around variation. Classically, variation is always assumed to be genetic, but from the beginning it has been appreciated that there can be variation induced by the environment. Indeed, this is the underpinning of the fruitless nature nurture conundrum. My thought, which stemmed from work on slime molds, was that there was third kind of variation that was neither genetic nor environmental, but a variation due to chance and that it might be put to use in development. My slime mold amoeba varied in diverse ways, such as size or stored energy derived from when they stopped eating, and thus at one end of the spectrum of this characteristic tended to become stock cells, while the others tend to become spores. Call this stochastic variation, uh, quote, range variation in size and cycle, and can remember being uh, headed for the idea by distinguished population geneticists. But now the idea has re-emerged in an important book, Chance, Development and Aging, by C. E. Finch and T. B. L. Kirkwood, who point out that aging shows the same kind of variation. Genetically identical animals do not die on the same day, but vary enormously in their lifespan, even in a carefully controlled identical environments. Finch and Kirkwood uh, are the ones who had the wit to call this what chance variation so much more compelling than range variation. I gave my last lecture to the freshmen and sophomores in the general biology course in the spring 1990, was just retiring and had reached the age of 70. Fortunately, someone had a tape recorder and gave me the tape of it because otherwise would have forgotten what said. It is a bit difficult to hear my words through all the rustling and coughing of the students and many of my odd old colleagues and friends who came to wish me well. Confessed that 40 years earlier, when gave my first lecture in the course, was incredibly nervous, and after all those years found myself just as nervous as my last lecture, did have more problems in the beginning, however. Remember one student who consistently sat in the front row, sound asleep with his head back and his mouth wide open, resisted the tremendous temptation to drop a piece of chalk into him. Now, all the sleeping people sit way in the back. That's the progress. The whole event warmed my heart. More than anything, it make, made me feel that I was entering a new era, and I did not know quite what to expect. There were two very good consequences. 
and no longer had to correct any exams and decided never to write another proposal for research grant, both of which consider regressive activities. What I regretted was that I had always enjoyed my teaching and expected to miss it. On the other hand, it dawned on me rather quickly that being emeritus was going to be like continuing sabbatical, and I had always found leaves of absence and revolt periods for scholarly activity. I consider myself very lucky to be able to keep my old office, which have occupied since 1948 in an addition to be given some mini-lab space among the graduate students, where I am able to continue with experiments. The office has a wonderful antique appearance, not much changed since it was built in 1910. It still has four lamps hanging from the ceiling with conical green glass shades. It makes me feel as for I should be wearing elastic armbands and celluloid eye shade. One great advantage in being emeritus was that I could travel at any time of the year and did not have to ask the dean for permission. Going places was something both Ruth and I enjoyed. It had always been my firm belief that the best way to travel was to go to one place and stay there for a while rather than rush about. By a stroke of good fortune, in 1901, had an invitation from a friend in Bangalore to join a conference he was organizing at an old hill station called Pachmati in central India. The prospect was exciting, but unfortunately, I had no funds for the trip. My friend said, hold on a bit. He would see what he could do. Sometime later, I got letter from the president of an Indian Academy of Sciences asking me to accept an appointment as the Raman professor for a period of two to three months. And not only would the cover our travel, but I would receive a stipend while in India. Furthermore, I could have space at the Indian Institute of Science and either live there in the guest house or at the Raman Institute, which was not too far away. It did not take me long to accept, and we made our reservation to leave the coming October. In years past, Ruth and I had talked about visiting India but in our ignorance, it was low on our list because we feared the extreme poverty and felt that unless one was Mother Teresa, it was a place to avoid. How wrong we were and how glad I am that the circumstances overruled worry 
that were sprouted by ignorance. For us, it was a new world. In some ways, it was like starting life all over again. I do not mean to imply that extreme poverty is not prevalent. We were warned that near the Bombay airport, we would see and smell extensive shanty towns, and we must still ourselves Forehand, being forewarned, helped but only a bit. Our arrival at the airport was rather grandly received by an airline official who whisked us through customs, helped us change some money, and got us into taxi for the hotel, brushing off the swarm of young boys and men who wanted to carry our bags. It was our first inkling that a Roman professor was something quite special. Very early the next morning we flew to Bhopal on the local flight, and right away we knew we really were in India. There was a simplicity and homeliness in everything in the domestic airport that stood in a stark contrast to the international airline and the fancy hotel. In Bhopal, all the conferences met in a small hotel for a delicious and much-needed breakfast, and then boarded a battered but for the most amazing all-day ride in the hills of Pachmarhi. The seats in the bus were hard and uncomfortable, but we hardly noticed, for the sights we saw on the roadside were so fascinating. There were the endless fields with walkers leaning over and tending to rise or doing other horse. The women were all in the colorful saris, which gave an impression of unreality. All along the roadside there were more men and women walking, often carrying loads. Occasionally we would see a painted oak cart with big wheels, all yellow and red and blue. Even the horns of the ox might be gaudily pointed as well. Often in the fields or along the road edge were cattle, but unfamiliar to us was the sight of buffalo with their curious black skin that looked as uh, though it had been polished. Now and then around the base of a tree. By the roadside there would be a small band of bonnet, macaque, monkeys, playing and watching the people and the traffic going by. The only jarring note in those reverting uh, pastoral scenes that whizzed by us was uh, that our driver spent most of his time leaning heavily on his horn for very little reason that we could see. It was for he wanted the world to be aware 
of our presence and in that he no doubt succeeded. That was not the end of the marvels. The villages were a behave of fascinating activity. Dogs and gray pigs wandering about the streets and minute shops, some seemingly no larger than a big box with a man sitting cross-legged inside it. Everyone seemed to have clean clothes. The men in very white shirts, the women in dazzling saris, and the children in school uniforms, one of the many unresented leftovers of British rule. We stopped at Itarsi for lunch. It is a small railway town, and as we staggered out of the bus into the intense sun, there immediately was the question of where 20 or so people could possibly find a place to eat. I need not have worried because my old friend and fellow slime old biologist Vidya Nanjun Diach, who was the organizer of the conference, disappeared down the street and soon returned to say all was said. We followed him to a small, dark and, and dingy restaurant where he had already ordered our lunch. It was quite delicious, spicy rice and a mixture of vegetables along with a cool beer. We were ready for a hot afternoon of pounding travel. Pachamarhi is a pretty town on the top of some hills. It used to be based for a British army and now it is there the Indian army has its camp for training army bands. We were put up in a small inn and sometimes we could hear military music in the great distance. Our quarters were comfortable. The beds incredibly hard, while we liked, and the pillows no thicker than an empty envelope, which we liked less. But best of all was the opportunity to meet many Indian scientists, both senior people and numerous bright and engaging graduate students. There were almost as many women in the group as men. Everyone was wonderfully open and responsive, so that we had many lively discussions. There were a few know it all in the group, but they were not rebuffed or in any way treated as uh, for they were different. Indians are perfectly equipped for lectures and conferences. They do not hesitate to give their views, and that is the true of the students as well. They are responsive and interested in what others have to say, and they are invariably considerate and polite. Furthermore, they laughed at my jokes, when I gave my lecture, what more can one ask of anyone? Pachamarhi is in the midst of a forest, which allowed me to see some Indian wildlife. There was my first encounter with langoes which I found very exciting. They have a distinctive hood that carries great distances. For monkeys, they seem large as they occasionally lop along the road. They are not 
particularly disturbed by the presence of human beings. They give the impression of looking down on one as some sort of inferior primate, and they might well be right. More often, my excitement centered around birds. I saw my first hornbills and my first bulbils uh, over the over ever present uh, monarchs were a source of fascination at first. Perhaps my biggest surprise was seeing wild peacocks and peahens uh, scurrying through the edge of the woods. The trip down to Bangalore was another big new advantage. We were driven back in, to Itarsi and waited for a train on a very hot platform alongside a cow that was calmly eating a newspaper out of the trash bin. The only fight, fright was that Ruth suddenly fainted, but fortunately I caught her on the way down. We stretched her out on our suitcases and she soon revived. Recovering completely after a good sleep on the train, there were six of us. Besides my host Vidya Nonjundiach, there was a mutual friend from Japan and two graduate students of Vidya's whom we got to know well. The compartment consisted of four berths perpendicular to the train and the two parallel and across the aisle. aisle. They were simple uh, pallets covered with a sheet and one of those modest pillows. We spent most of our time peering out of the windows with quite a different view of the countryside from that of the bus, but one equally absorbing. The trip took 36 hours, and we were very lucky to be under the care of our Indian friends because they knew how to get the meals, which were remarkably good for train fare, and how to dash out at station stops and buy some of those delicious small bananas without being left behind. Our life in Bangalore could not have been more pleasant. We lived in the guest house and my office was five minute walk away. The grounds of the Indian Institute of Science are like great botanic garden with a large variety of uh, flowering trees and shrubs, all beautifully cared for by a team of gardeners. There were a great number of colorful birds from large vultures that nested in the main tower of the institute to small uh, sunbirds and pair of which nested in a bowl of all old caterpillar cobwebs by the entrance of the guest house. Dear to my heart were the coppersmith harbors, the minivets and the flocks of parakeets that looked like small parrots. But there were many other sights as well, such as a sudden cloud of a huge fruit bats or flying foxes that would appear in the very brief tropical twilight. 
I would never leave our room without a pair of binoculars. Mainly through Vidya, but also through the Raman connection, we met many splendid people, very bright and interesting to talk to, and always kind and helpful. We were taken to the Indian Academy of Science annual meeting, which that year was held in Bhubaneswar, on the east coast of India, where I had to give a lecture. I meant more fascinating and different countryside, but it also meant meeting more interesting people. We had two guides, one of whom was Raghavendra Gadagkar, who took care of us from Bangalore and back. We became good friends and went on to collaborate on a paper that compared his social wasps and my social amoeba. At the meeting, a graduate student I knew from Bangalore asked me if I was enjoying myself in India. I said enormously I could not get over or explain why everyone was so kind to us. He said with a big smile, that's because in India we respect learning and we respect age. I realized that in any country there is a mixture of different degrees of excellence in science and that I was at one of the centers of the very best science in India. Many of my colleagues there were world class. Generally, they had made their postgraduate studies in foreign university. They all spoke perfect English, not the universal language of science. They were broadly literate outside their specialized field, in their manners more often than not, were warm and charming. To give some examples, Gada Car, whom I mentioned above, has done and is doing work of great importance on the evolution and behavior of social wasps. Sokumar, who has done so much to elucidate the habits and the ecology of wild elephants. Nonjun Diach, who is one of the leaders in my own field of slime mold biology. The other thing that is impressive in the high level of intelligence is high level of intelligence and achievement of the graduate students. They are so easy to talk to, so responsive, and the best are not afraid to use their imagination. The whole atmosphere of Indian Institute of Science vibrated and I found it very stimulating. One day at lunch, in the guest house, I sat next to an interesting physicist from another part of India. He was very forthright, no beating around the bush, and he asked me if I didn't find the social hierarchy in India disturbing, coming as I did from a relatively democratic country. He down on me that I had never thought about it, which I confessed and uh, immediately began to take notice. In the department where I was working, there indeed was a remarkably clear-cut hierarchy. The head secretary was a nice young man from Goa, and I realized that when I went to him for a pad or some paper clips, he never gave them to me himself. He always gave a rough, gruff command to a subordinate who scurried off to get what I needed. Beneath the subsecretary sub were the cleaners who swept out the offices and they were ordered about by everyone. Mentioned to a charming professor at the Raman Institute that noticed in the 
horrendous traffic of Bangalore that the only traffic rule was one of might. The trucks cut in front of the cars, the cars in front of the motorcycles. The Lord did it over the bicycles. He laughed and said that is the Indian hierarchical way. During one period, could watch some major construction work going on in a building across the day from my office. The chain of command was obvious. There were the big bosses who arrived in clean white shirts and would give orders with abandon. There were the foremen who oversaw the workmen. There were the ma masons next in line. And finally, there were many men and even more women who did the manual labor. The women worked non-stop for a very long day, carrying great loads of bricks in a large saucer on their heads and walking barefoot up a steep bamboo ramp to the second floor. They would dump the bricks in a pile in front of men who threw the bricks one by one to another man on the third floor where they were put on another big saucer and carried by another woman always in a sari to the mason on another part of the roof. Cement was made in a hand crank mixer to man cranking and once the cement was in saucer it was handed with great speed from one man above another on a long ladder to the roof. Needless to say, all this interfered greatly with my work. The thing found especially distressing was, was that the women, who always seemed to me to be working hardest, were paid very much less than the men. Yet despite all the extremely hard work they did, not beha behave as for they were oppressed. Could see them joking and laughing as they pushed on with their heavy labor. Middle class Indians lead a comfortable life, sometimes bordering on the elegant. Can they remember going to a dinner at the house of professor who was a kind friend? We were the only non-Indians there. The house was simple, yet quite beautiful. The living room had a dark red stone floor, white walls, and no pictures, just small Hindu shrine high on one wall. There was no furniture at first, but as the food and the drink arrived, we were given chairs. It was a beautiful scene because all the women wore particularly elegant saris that made everything glitter. I think I learned more about the people of India from reading the novels of R.K. Narayan that I did from my own limited view. His tales of the people in his small imaginary town give such crystal clear, sympathetic insight into the minds of his uh, characters that one learns about humanity in general and Indians in particular. Those short novels are games. Started reading them there and they suddenly made me see things that had not the understanding or the wit to see before. We visited uh, Mysore where he lives and I wished we had met him. One is constantly reminded uh, of the enormous influence of the British. It is not just that English is the universal language of the educated, for there are so many local languages that were had to be. Some way all Indians could communicate with one another, uh, something that Hindu, Hindi was never able to achieve. There is much more. What surprised me so much is that even though the desire for freedom from British rule 
was and remains paramount, things British are not resented, and in fact, the good points that they're left behind are admired. Nothing brought this home more to me than the huge square in Bangalore that there is a gold statue of Mahatma Gandhi at one end walking with his beggar stick and at the other there is an enormously stout and severe Queen Victoria sitting unseemingly on her throne. How remarkable it is that she was not pulled down in the joyous moment of independence. But then, that was the moment of Manbatan, who was the viceroy at the ceremony, their power was transferred, was mobbed as uh, he and Lady Manbatan rode in a parade in their carriage. The mob didn't come to do harm, as was feared, but freed the horses and uh, pulled the carriage of state themselves. The Indians are a proud people, but they do not bear the same kind of grudges used to. For me, the best moments of all in India were spent in wilder places. We saw many ancient Hindu temples that were spectacular with the filigree depictions of the great legends or of the joys of sex, and while I found them beautiful and impressive, it was wilds that held me in a thrall. This was especially in the case in our two visits to the great uh, preserve of Mudumalai, south of Bangalore. The trip there is a lovely drive through the country. Much of the road is lined with ancient trees put there by some Maharaja many years ago. Mudamalai is a great protected area with a fairly dry scrub forest of teak and many other trees. 